Hello, everyone, and welcome to our product discussion around, panel discussion around creation of the cross-functional team and collaboration. I'm going to be today as a moderator. Uh, my name is Anastasia. I'm senior product manager at Checkout, responsible for alternative payment methods. So what does it mean? It's literally everything which is uh, all the payment methods besides car schema processing. And today we have a few uh, panelists who will help me hear and share the experience. We will start with a short intro, uh, intro session. Margarita, would you like to start first? Definitely. So my name is Margarita. I currently work at Amazon as a senior product manager. I've been a product manager for a few years now. Um, right now, I'm focusing mostly on what we call the core shopping experience. So everything that improves the customer journey from finding the products on Amazon to the actual um, checkout process. And nice awesome. to meet you. Awesome. Thank you. Eitan, how about you? Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, I'm Eitan. I was a PM at Google for just over 15 years. Came in through DoubleClick. I worked as a PM in ads for about a decade. Built Google's interest-based ads uh, products, then had a number of other roles, uh, led a variety of solutions across internal systems for HR tech, legal tech, marketing tech, um, and a variety of ML solutions and so forth. Uh, I loved not just working with product and edge, but working closely with sales, services, marketing, bringing products to market, growing the business around it, and so on. And thank you for having me here. Great. Thank you. And Ed, a few words about you. Yes, um, my name is Ed Summers. I uh, was most recently a product manager at uh, Lyft, focusing on um, the software that runs their rideshare rental operations. And in addition to kind of a core business, they owned vehicles they could rent out to to drivers, um, you know, through to the Express Drive program. Um, and you know, my team managed the software that that ran that and ensured you know the fleet was running at high efficiency. The vehicles were getting um, you know repaired on time, and our drivers were getting getting the most most out of that program. Um, you know, prior to that, I was uh, in logistics and transportation, working on software primarily for logistics shippers, and then before that, 3D printing and uh, manufacturing as well. So I have a lot of experience working with different uh, you know, cross-functional teams from operations stakeholders to, you know, sales and customer success as well. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Good. So we can start. But I would like to also mention that before we will start, there is a comment blo block where you can submit all of your questions. And Whatever, we'll still have a few minutes, we can come back to that and also cover them during the conversation or come back in FAQ round after the main panel discussion. So if you don't mind, we can start our session. So I will start with you, Margarita. You're working quite already. You shared a huge experience around your uh, product uh, drive. How about at your team, you have many a collaborative teams you have also many um cross-functional setup across the company how do you and each team has their own vision the mission goals okrs how do you make uh, clear that your team and especially the teams with with whom you need to agree on some deliverables and work closely you are defining the shared vision yeah that's actually very important i think as a product manager that is one of our biggest drivers, making sure that everyone understands and um, has a clear vision of the objectives that we're building. And I've actually learned that aligning diverse teams hinges a lot on establishing a clear why um, that does resonate across different functions. It involves just, you know, like moving from the isolated tasks to actually ensuring that everyone understands how those tasks unify to a bigger strategy and sets a clear vision that resonates with each team, especially when they each have their own aspirations and um, objectives. And I think that what I've seen um, often during teams, for example, like when we think about options like onboarding pages on a website, um, a designer could be working on the entire onboarding session while a developer is focusing mostly on a single button. So 
they are all working at a different versions of a zoomed in or zoomed out um, option. However, the overarching goal for both is to streamline users' logging experience. And I think as a product manager, I need to ensure that everyone connects to that overarching experience. And I achieve this in different ways. One is setting weekly sessions where we have demos or ideation or just vision workshops. Um, and um, those, I try to showcase everyone's work and it helps to provide a space so that everyone sees how their individual tasks contribute to enhancing the overall user experience. Um, yeah, and, and it moves away from just the contribution, but also kind of also the realization of that project. Awesome, thank you very much. Rita, how about you? Do you have any best practice which you can share with us? Yeah, great, thanks. So I think it all starts from, um, you know, it depends a little bit on where you are in the overall process uh, and life cycle. And so, or, or where you are from a perspective of the annual flow. And so I tend to think of it as uh, starting with an annual strategy. Um, typically, actually, ideally, it's a multi-year strategy that you're trying to pursue. And you work closely with engineering, with UX, with PGMs, and then even more broadly, uh, cross-functionally with sales and services and marketing, depending if you're driving a consumer product or more of a B2B business. Uh, but if it's a bit more on the B2B side, uh, as for example, the um, w where I spend time in ads, uh, we worked very closely uh, and brought together a, a core team uh, with a lead from sales, a lead from services, a lead from marketing, um, uh, myself as a lead from product and you know so on from engine UX. And we would develop uh, a strategy based on an understanding of the marketplace um, and translate that into a 12 month roadmap and annual goals, annual OKRs, quarterly goals. And we establish a whatever appropriate rhythm of meetings where they're monthly, weekly, bi-weekly to check in and drive strategies and plans against each of those. And so when each team developed their OKRs, uh, they were connected to the larger multi-year strategy to the annual goals. Um, and that way we were all rowing in the same direction. Um, well, awesome. But how about, let's say, as you, you're covered, you're working with sales, commercials, with any other teams, of course, you can share, let's say, vision, because vision for the company in general, it's shared long-term goals. But every team has they, let's say, they specific OKRs. At some point, they drive in these goals. How, which kind of practices you actually applying around communication across or married in this case, internal team goals in order to drive one vision? Yes. So uh, when I said vision, I don't mean a company-wide vision, mm -hmm. uh, and especially if you think of a. Uh, obviously, it depends on the size of the company. At a place like Google, there's, um, <laughs> you know, uh, many different teams with different focuses, all lining up to the same Google-wide mission. But um, within ads, uh, at Google, just to give sort of a concrete example, there's, you know, there were search ads and there was display ads. And within display ads, there were, I don't know, six to eight different sub-areas. And within one of those was the area I was focused on. And so we aimed to run our product as if it was a standalone business, obviously mm -hmm. within the larger context of everything else. And so we developed a vision for um, revenue growth, for customer growth, um, for future capabilities, for our competitive standing, and developed that vision, developed an annual strategy and so on. And so we very much focused everything I described on our own internal team goals mm -hmm. uh, towards that. Um, and then wrote those documents together. So there'd be a single shared vision document, a single shared set of um, higher level OKRs that each sub team could then write their own more detailed quarterly and, and you know, plans mm -hmm. within and link them all together to that one shared doc. Um, and we'd have various tracking processes in place, whether a spreadsheet or uh, another type of more sophisticated system to keep track on a monthly, weekly basis. Everything I'm describing is the theory behind it. In practice, of course, none of those things ever happen as smoothly and cleanly as you'd like. Nobody really enjoys updating spreadsheets or task planning and uh, weekly meetings sometimes are super valuable, sometimes are you know meeting for the sake of meeting. Um, and so it's really up to you as a PM to make them valuable, to keep them 
focused on the goal and make sure there's accountability and, and updates from each of the various areas. I see. So, for example, from my experience, if you take a look, we are working in B2B market and check out is responsible for financial services. So as I'm as a team or product manager of one huge team responsible for specific domain, we have also shared uh, topics with other products. And sometimes it's very it's really hard to align on the vision and align on delivery plan across all, all the teams. So literally, I see that communication across team is the, is the most valuable thing which you need to establish. So what would be your recommendation or strategy how to be more clear on that communication? Great. Aiden. Yes, great question. So um, I think it all builds on relationships. As you said, communication is sort of at the heart of everything. Um, okay. And so do you have a relationship with the individual leads from those areas? Are you spending time with them one-on-one -on -one in addition to in the group settings? And before you even start to get into work and the, what are we trying to do and how do we go about it, getting to know them personally, developing the relationship. Once you have that relationship, then it's a lot as a PM about listening and understanding where they're coming from, what their goals are, what their motivations are for, for their function or their sub team and seeing where they're aligned or not aligned. And if it's not aligned, that's, that can, that's okay. It's legitimate. It's, it's the reality. And so just trying to create as much visibility around that. Um, where there is alignment, of course, it's easier. You put it all together and, and you pull it out. When, when there's not alignment, then um, you can have a series of reviews with the appropriate leadership folks from each team and each function and uh, decide on the path ahead. In an ideal world, you would at some point uh, bring it down to and, and agree to disagree and have a committed set of goals. Sometimes that's not so easy to reach and there'll be ongoing friction. Um, but the more you can create visibility around it to manage expectations and even just being aware that, hey, this is our number one priority. This is your fifth priority. That's simply the reality. We need to work around that and recognize how much time and attention each team can give to it accordingly uh, so that you can minimize frustration. Yeah, thank you very much. Margarita, how about you? How, about you? how do you establish, like what is your experience in establishing good cross-team collaboration and especially communication across them? Yeah, I think very much, uh, like Aiton mentioned, it's largely relationships. Um, and once you establish those relationships, it makes very easy to establish communication. Um, I personally like to prioritize a centralized communication platform like, for example, Slack. And I really enjoy those kinds of platforms because it provides a vehicle so that every single team member can stay updated. Um, it's a place where they can share documents, they can collaborate in real time. And I think that's so important for communication. I do this for each one of my projects. I have a designated group chat and this enhances obviously transparency, but also reduces the risk of miscommunication. And what I really, really like to do in this chat is pin a few files uh, so that people can always come in, access them. And then we also have our weekly cross-functional meetings. And what I mean with cross-functional meetings is a meeting where we have everyone from designers to engineers to developers, just making sure that everyone who belongs in, as part of this project is present because it is in those spaces, not only where we report progress, but also kind of where we dive into challenges, um, start planning what's ahead. And it just creates a space for immediate feedback and alignment. And I guess to just ensure that there is inclusivity and kind of continuity to the meetings, another big aspect of communication is being able to document uh, precisely what are the next steps, if those next steps are assigned to someone, um, who would be the owner, the timelines, if there's a decision made or an outstanding question, just making sure that we document those um, are just such important parts of it. And I guess the other aspect of communication, especially as a product manager, is a lot of like visual management tools like dashboards or Kanban boards or whatever kind of uh, board that actually provides a lot of at a glance view of our project status. This helps identify a lot of like bottlenecks or misalignments, and it just helps everyone understand where we stand in terms of the project. Thank you. Thank you for your details. 
Ed, as we are talking now, we'll be touching also alignment, as it's very important for all of us. How you would, for example, you would identify that the, the misalignment happened? So, for example, like, you know, everything in theory works well, but misalignment is also one of the issues we have in this time. Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. I mean, I think, you know, the, the other panelists have mentioned, you know, relationships and, and open communication. I think it really starts there. Um, you know, building a strong relationship with the leaders on the other cross-functional teams that you're working with, whether that be, you know, an operations team or sales or customer success, um, you know, make sure that they have the space to, to identify that. Um, you know, I would also say in those contexts, it's, you know, helpful to kind of proactively check in on, you know, whether there is some, some misalignment, you know, make sure you're getting feedback from your teams as well. So you can, you can raise that in a timely manner. Um, you know, I think when that's identified, you know, most, most people will want to work in good faith to, to help resolve that. Um, and if you're already coming into a certain project with, you know, we talked before about very having, you know, shared objectives and a shared vision, um, you know, and I would also add, you know, having shared goals and, and high level OKRs, um, you know, you can really help work with that other team, you know, help them understand maybe how this misalignment might be impacting, you know, both of our goals and, you know, what we can do to, to get that on track. Um, you know, because ultimately everybody, you know, they want to be, be successful. They want to achieve their goals. You know, if it's a sales team, they want to, want to hit their targets. If, you know, you're a, a PM and a development team, you want people to be using, using your product and providing feedback to continuously improving that. So, um, you know, finding that common ground is, is very important to pushing, you know, getting past and resolving this alignment. Good. Thank you. As an example, at this moment is. You've already mentioned that each of the companies where we work, they are large. We have a lot of stakeholders across each team. We have upstream, downstream teams. And in that case, how it's very hard, like one team ha can have one product manager, another one has huge vertical and hierarchy of them. So stakeholders sometimes it's very hard to identify. In a case where you need to have alignment across some specific feature, how you define your stakeholder, how you make the roles about them. Aiden, what would be your pra practices around that? Great question. So I think, uh, you know, we mentioned communication earlier. Um, in, in these kinds of situations, I think over communicating is often a good approach. And so, and having different channels to communicate, uh, emails, one-on-ones, group meetings, documents. And so uh, having a wider canvas to start to let folks uh, across a broader group of uh, leadership in all levels and and all the potential stakeholders know, hey, we're about to get started on this thing. And here's our plan. Here's our process. And we're going to have a kickoff meeting and could go a bit broader in the invite for those types of meetings. And then now we're down to a more active working group that meets more regularly. Um, it takes a lot of time and effort to meet with each individual team and sub team, but it's often so worth it because when you don't it ends up taking you much more time on the back end to fix things and correct things when uh miscommunications or misalignment happen and so spending the time up front to meet with everyone and uh understand how to what degree they want to be involved who from their team ought to be involved in what levels in the working team or as an fyi or as having input and then establishing an effective structure um, to communicate around that through a variety again of meetings and emails and so on um, and so yeah. that's, that's, uh, sort of where it begins. And then you have just regular check-ins and touch points because you'd be keeping, uh, keeping to group meetings and one-on-ones and sort of, uh, back channel communications throughout to hear if anything is, uh, going sideways. Great. I think in, from my experience point of view, we figure out that the main issue when, first of all, misalignment happening, that we drive in different goals within the same time. So it means that for me is a value A, let's say I'm working on delivery a payment method, another team with whom I need to collaborate, they are responsible for, let's say, some card processing or whatsoever, but we using the same service. And what I figure out at that time, we have look like a different currencies. So for example, for me, I'm driving a number of payment methods, another one driving volume. So in that case, what I found, it's very important to find kind of similar exchange rate, which leads that when you are driving your own um, some metrics, then they feed it into the metrics of your counterpart. So then you can buy in and say, hey, I'm now working on 
activation of new payment method, it means it brings more volume. In this case, if it's bringing more volume, you're also getting some value of that. You're getting this metrics going up. So both of us uh, have a limited value out of what we actually require to do. So basically, I start, uh, in my practice, I'm mostly thinking about, because sometimes it's really hard to understand what's the value of one team towards another one. So I try to be in the issues and discuss or, uh, on different priorities alignments only from position of that stakeholder. So literally, if I need to, I know that these guys driving, let's say, number of active customers within any point of time, I will think how I can adapt my metrics, my topics, so that will also help them to lead and drive the, uh, the metrics. So it helps me to think about that from, from financial point of view around exchange rate, let's say. What does it mean to exchange my goals into their ones? So it was interesting to have. Good. So how about talking about our sales, com uh, commercials? They mostly working with our um, merchants, customers, buyers, etc. So it means that mostly they know the feedback. They know what's go uh, what they need, our main customers. How in that case, Ed, you will see we can actually get that feedback or write feedback from upstream teams into the product development? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think you know the foundation you know for all cross functional collaboration is building that communication and, and intimacy. Um, you know, so I think it's it starts there. If you are closer to those teams, if you're closer to the sales team or customer success, let's say. Um, you know, it's really easy to find the right people, tap them on the shoulder, you know, to, to, to try to start getting that feedback. Um, and then, you know, the next thing I would say is to, to be able to, you know, sit with them to understand how they interact with the customers. So if it's, say, a customer success team, um, you know, sit with them, answer customer service tickets, and you can see, you know, what, what they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. You can hear the voice of the, voice of the customer directly. Um, and, you know, I also had a, another important point, and this was, you know, a big part of my uh, experience was I was in the logistics tech space, which was very B2B oriented, um, is that to have a, you know, systematic way to, you know, collect and organize feedback and conversations that we're getting from customers. So when I was at LoadSmart, our sales team used um, Salesforce to track all these interactions. And, um, you know, it might be very hard to get a customer on the phone for, you know, a deep dive or product feedback conversation. But. Um, you know, we could learn a lot about what customers needed, even from, you know, the initial discovery calls our sales team was having. So we built a way to, um, you know, or categorize our product feedback in, in Salesforce. It was, you know, one drop down that a salesperson had to add at the end of a conversation. Um, and we could use that to extract data from customers who might not be, um, you know, the most willing to stand up to have a call to provide a lot of detailed feedback. Um, and it really helped, you know, must measure the direction of the broader customer base and what they needed. Awesome, thank you. What about you, Margarita? How do you approach that? Yeah, I think different ways. Um, one of them is obviously having a strong collaboration with those teams. Um, just making sure that I set up regular joint meetings with them, not only to discuss the customer feedback, but also kind of delve into what that feedback actually means for our product. Um, when it is possible, I try to interact in those customer interactions by joining call services um, because this firsthand experience, I think just being in touch with a customer is so valuable to provide a clear window, you know, of like what the customer is going through, what are their needs, what are their concerns? And it helps streamline a lot of, a lot of this um, insights. And I think knowledge is also kind of a two-way door. Um, of course, like leveraging information from these teams is important, but I also make it a point to arrange sessions with sales and customer success teams so I can also provide understandings of what the product is um, so that they can also immerse themselves in understanding our, you know, like processes, how we develop them. And um, I can also understand, obviously, their source sell process, their success strategies, um, and there's a mutual understanding around the context of customer insights and and where exactly um, they are. Awesome. Thank you for your feedback. From my point of view, I also work quite a lot with commercial uh, sales as well. So we try to teach ourselves how we need to cooperate together. So what I mean, usually when feedback comes and they say, like, I need a feature A, without 
really business case why that required what's the floor for that we tend to define some kind of minimum list of questions which we usually if we are not allowed let's say to talk directly to merchants if we and we are not presented there we are training uh, we train our sales and commercials to ask that specific question and provide us feedback on that so literally our sales or commercials they are coming to the merchant they uh, they during the first round of presenting our solution they also start asking questions which we basically want to have answers for and in that case i'm collecting them i see okay that merchant needs that and that so then at least if i'm not allowed to join i at least have some kind of answers and feedback uh, anastasia why, why would you ever not be allowed to join I tell you because first of all, sometimes even like I'm not capable physically. I'm, for example, on another session. So, but we try to train everyone, every sales and commercial, so they also have some kind of mind of product. So they think in also not from only one merchant point of view, but how that feature will impact others. And when they come into, we also establish roundtables around uh, with merchants, but it helps us to track all that feedback in one single format. So then it's also easier to digest at the end. If you have, let's say, hundreds of merchants with whom you need to uh, discuss the same thing, you have a template, you know what is expected, and then you can come back to answer any other session, uh, other questions. But usually why we are not allowed, as I'm saying, like I'm in one time zone, like for example, today with you, the person is in another time zone, not every time you can spend time with merchants, but we, of course, try to improve there. And also one thing which is for sure working for, for us, as you mentioned, establish a weekly, bi-weekly, whatever, sequencing of, uh, of sessions where we, even by, by region, because checkout is a global payment, uh, payment for PSP provider. So by each region, we set up sales and commercial roundtable where we can consume the all feedback which they receive. By the way, we also have solution engineers who are literally using our product and helping our, uh, our merchant to, to drive the onboarding or integration. So they also extract and collect feedback uh, with them. So we try to establish single process around different teams, which helps everyone to drive the same goal. How about you? Anything to add it up, Aiden? Uh, yeah, well, it looks like Ed wanted to say something. Um, yeah, yeah sure. I, I would add, you know, the it's it's important, you know, that the sales team, of, as you're using that feedback, developing uh, your product or building out a roadmap that, you know, they're seeing the results of that as well. So, you know, going if you're having regular follow up meetings with the sales team, for example, that's an opportunity for you as a PM to, you know, say, maybe push, ask some deeper questions on on a particular piece of customer feedback. Um, you know, but also really make sure that those, you know, sales team, customer success, solutions engineering, for example, they are really, you know, up to date on the latest things that are happening in the product. So if you've, you know, you're planning on building a new feature that they can kind of preview that potentially to customers and get their reaction for it, um, you know, as you're rolling out things that they can, you know, communicate to their customers as well. I mean, I, you know, definitely sometimes, but honestly, as you were saying, you, you can't be in every single meeting at a, every um, time, even though it might be really beneficial. So, you know, I've tried to sit in on on some sales calls, be available to answer answer questions. But you know, it might be you get one half hour interaction with the customer; they might opt not to buy the product, and you can still learn, um, you know, why and, and potentially make changes even even based on that. So, um, you know, making sure that as you're collecting that feedback, the teams that you're working with can see the results of that. Um, you know, and they can see both your you know progress toward your goals moving in the same direction is very important to help you know continue to build that trust and get additional feedback. And at the case, let's say, because we are now becoming more remote first, at that case, how you establish the relationship and communication with the teams uh, when we are working across the globe and how to avoid to have silos in that case? What would be your suggestions? Ed, you can start also. Um, yeah, I would say the you know most helpful thing, especially if you're working with with distributed teams is to have that, you know, regular communication cadence, right? That, um, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, meetings over video, for example, but, um, you know, to have regular check-ins on Slack, um, you know, time to update the goals and see progress against that. So if you have a document that's tracking that, that's, um, you know, that's very helpful. But um, yeah, having that you know, regular communication cadence helps keep people on the same page. They understand, you know, okay, I need 
some information to update the team at this time. Um, you know, they can have that ready to go in advance. Um, and it, you know, kind of prevents people from, you know, slipping back into those silos, you know, you know, people naturally want to focus on, on their day to day, right. Um, you know, what's the most in, important thing that they're working on within, within their own function. Um, you know, so without that regular structure, it, it, you know, it becomes very easy to, to slip back into your own silo. So I think having that is important and, you know, setting those expectations that those communications are important, you know, they help, um, you know, improve the product to drive, drive it forward as well as is important to set. Awesome. Thank you very much. And how about you, Margarita? What would be your best practices for that? I think in a remote first environment, just to make sure that, you know, like to avoid silos and make everyone involved and productive, um, very much like I mentioned, communication is such a lifeline for remote teams and just making sure that there's a space to establish that regular communication, whether those are daily standups or weekly meetings, is such an important aspect. Um, and I agree there, there is an importance of the collaboration tools that, um, are important specifically for shared digital workspaces. But I also think there's another aspect to preventing teams from, you know, feeling siloed or, or, or kind of like not connected. And it is, um, uh, making sure that you also provide a space where, you know, there has a uh, virtual social and cultural activities. I think um, we mostly for focus a lot on work, but there's also the um, individual aspect and you can't disconnect those two when you're working with people. And I think it's such an important part of like team building processes. Um, and also when you're doing this, making sure that you bring along everyone in the decision-making process. You don't have to agree, agree with everyone, but at least make sure that everyone understands um, why we're agreeing or why we're committing to something. Awesome. Ethan, do you want to follow up or you have something to say also? Uh, sure. So I think it depends a little bit. Um, so if we're talking about sales uh, and sort of frontline folks, um, for example, back in the day, we had product specialists who were regionally focused. And so they could be sort of the uh, essential funnel to communicate information out or back in. Mm -hmm. And they would have uh, the more effective ones would establish um, various groups within their region of local ex experts in various different distributed sales teams and different verticals and sales channels. And, and they'd hold sort of biweekly, monthly get togethers and lunch and learns or, you know, a variety of different tactics like that to share information with them and information back. Um, and so that could work really well. Uh, you know, it's interesting when you discuss remote first, I think of, again, my time at in the early days at Google, uh, working in ads, we were in office, but my end team was in California. I was in New York. Um, sales were in all different offices, or even if in the same building on a completely different floor, and of course spread out globally. And so we were remote by definition, and that still worked well because we we had the right syncs and all of that stuff. Um, certainly, time zone makes it more difficult if it's farther apart, but. Um, all very achievable. If it's if we're talking about engineering cross-functional with UX and PGM and so on, regardless of time zone, regardless of location, you need to have the same set of meetings. And if you're further apart, you need to have more meetings. It's uh, it's um, something people hate. <laughs> yeah. you don't like to spend time in meetings, and yet it's unavoidable. And it's sort of just creating sort of a cultural awareness that sometimes you know if sometimes meetings feel like they're not as productive as they could be, but the lack of that meeting would quickly lead to a breakdown of communication and so on. And so sort of everybody just agreeing to that. And of course, I'm not trying to dismiss or, or excuse poor meeting management. Uh, you need to do all the right things to have effective meetings as much as you can. But um, again, I think it, it, when you're remote, it goes back to a bit of over communication. And when you have a stronger personal relationship as well, then you have all the informal Slack, chat, one-on-one -on -one emails, one-on-one -on -one chats to reinforce everything. And so that's, that becomes super critical. It's very time consuming if, you know, you need to have a dozen different one-on-one -on -one chats with different t folks, but um, the value of it is, is yeah. high. Yeah, good, thank you. From my point of view, I especially work, like I'm from Berlin and we have also offices across the globe. I do at least try visit one or another office and as much I can build direct relationship 
with people face to face, it works better. So if you have a like, I would definitely recommend if you have a chance to see your colleagues from another office, for sure use this time visit them, even it's not required to have a meeting and have official conversation about anything, but it's really just to build that kind of level of deep and good open relationship is is pay, pay out at the end. So it's the best what I, what I would recommend. And also it helps when you establish kind of open conversation or open feedback at that time. So basically then you can, first of all, you're establishing deep, close relationship with people and then you train the team to be open for feedback and also sharing that feedback and if you can basically make this successfully then it doesn't matter where you actually sit in in which office but i also tell you especially in the area of financing where you need to work with downstream teams like legal uh, finance treasury where a lot of regulation um, it's very important to have the they domain uh, understand their domain and understand what they need. And especially sometimes even have, in our case, like we tend to have remote two days in the week and three days at the office. And even though I'm working for, with another area, I still come into the office to see that people, to know them because we are one team and our main goals are the same. So therefore like really try, is if there is a chance to visit people and get a, a coffee, not, uh, via Zoom, that it's also very important. Okay, let's move to, so how much time we have? I think we run out of time already, but I would like to go through the comment and commented questions. So I think we covered already regarding remote work. What are the, some of the best practices to engage with cross-functional team? As we mentioned that it's better to first of all, build the clo deep close relationship with people and also visit them and try to share your ideas with them also uh is there anything else okay how does how does the convincing happen for inclusion of digital transformation project success in okr of cross cross functional teams sales marketing commercial team members uh margarita would you like to take one sure um i think a lot of it is convincing people um, around demonstrating value and the relevance of digital transformation. Um, when we actually think about different teams like sales and marketing, they all have their drive, they're closer to the customer, they have a lot of like the understanding of what could potentially be a good OKR. But I think also um, being able to connect those with value is what actually is going to move the needle and, and make sure that we're driving those. Um, and when I talk about value, it's just demonstrating how that aligns with the overarching goals of the organization. Um, is you know, like, how do we connect those between the objectives of this teams, like the sales, the marketing, the commercial teams, but with the um, transformation that we're kind of trying to drive? Good. Anything to add? Would you like to add some comments also? Uh, yeah, I would say from, you know, from a perspective of value, um, you know, it's helpful when you're working with, you know, any internal teams, and this could be in the context of a digital transformation project or, or you know, just day-to-day -day work. You know, if you want to change a process, you know, update something, them, understand how it really makes their job easier. Um, you know, is it something that's going to be saving time? Is it, you know, going to be helping them, let's say a sales team, you know, reach out to more customers more efficiently, uh, potentially close more deals? Um, so always, you know, when phrasing those those goals, like put it in the language that those teams are, you know, used to working in um, and really help them understand the value, you know, to that team, to the individuals day to day as well. Good. Thank you. Ethan, I would like to ask you how, like, as we work across different teams, how would you recommend to establish uh, psychological safety across the cross-functional setup? What would be your best strategies for that? Great question. Um, so I'll, I'll connect it back to uh, the prior question as well. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> you know, I think as PMs, we tend to be quite good at meeting with customers and listening and listening to the customer, truly understanding their needs as different from what they want, um, making the customer feel heard, making the customer feel like you're listening and are going to build something that will help them. 
I've found for myself, I often have not successfully used that same approach with internal teams. And it's in essence the same thing in every relationship and every communication you have uh, with whatever stakeholder team uh, or even your own team members, truly listening, um, understanding what they're, what's motivating them, what their pain points are, how what you're doing can solve what they're trying to achieve, ensuring that they feel heard, playing it back to them, and then showing them how what you already have or what you aim to put together is going to help address those things or charting a path to get there if it's not quite there yet. And so this notion of feeling heard or not, I think is probably the most important element. You know, we all have, hopefully, most folks we're working with have strong opinions, ideally strong opinions loosely held, one of my favorite quotes. Um, uh, but everybody has a point of view. Everybody's coming at it from a slightly different place. Everybody's hearing something a little bit differently from each other. And so spending the extra time to listen and validate and understand where they're coming from uh, builds starts to build a relationship. Um, and if you start from a relationship first perspective versus a task first or objective first, hey, we need to get this done. Why aren't you aligned? Why, why are you, you know, why is there friction? If you start from a relationship first basis, um, then it, it starts to create that sort of trust and credibility. And that's the foundation of psychological safety. Thank you. So what you're trying to say, just to summarize, it's literally that internal stakeholders, they are similar customers or even sometimes require more, more explanation, more involvement, more engagement. And then we at this moment train to be, because we are looking at the end to end customer experience, but it's sometimes we need to actually look into inside world of the company uh, across other stakeholders and drive them as similar as we will do for our direct customers. And even, yeah, to add to that, if you think of, you know, if you're meeting with a particular unit and a customer team, they will often need to, if you if you've convince them, they will need ammunition to convince their surrounding team, their leadership and so forth. And so you put information in front of them to make it easy for them. So too with an internal team, hey, if you've got a variety of different priorities and goals that your team is focused on, they're all legitimate. Um, here's the information you need and here's how I can help you position that within your own org relative to everything else. And so I, know, I realized years ago that um, organizational strategy, organizational dynamics is very similar to product strategy. They're both strategy in the sense of you need to understand the vision of where, what you want to achieve. Uh, you need to have a, stra a strategy or a game plan to get there, uh, a roadmap and a timeline and phases. So too with any internal relationship with internal goal setting, if you're not aligned right away, you can't just auto-magically align overnight. You need to have a strategy, a roadmap, a timeline phases to get there. Um, and the more intentional you are about that, the more uh, successful you can be and the less um, frustration you'll have, uh, the less anxiety you'll have uh, when things aren't quite working because you'll have more actionable next steps and sort of a better understanding of what's causing them as opposed to worrying about, you know, your role in, in, in the friction. Awesome. Thank you for that. Just also give you some my perspective on how I try to approach that. When we discuss and we're learning on some of the tasks, I'm also looking at the, first of all, what the person, what this team needs and providing the trade-offs. So literally like there's potentially one solution, but you can have a different pros and cons for one, for different options. One is for, for sure could be, for example, better for me, but another one for another team. Or the third option can be, from organization point of view, the best one. And basically then, in order to align what approach to take, what solution to drive, look at that trade-offs and see what are pros and cons for options and agree together on that, you know, on the path, how you will approach that at the end. Good. Mark, uh, I think we run out of time. It, so many questions which we would I would like to for sure cover through, but I think we need to finish. Just a few, just to summarize, Ed, would you like to give some, let's say, top advices or, to our audience how to build the best relationship with uh, across the teams? Sure, I think you know we talked a lot about communication, but you know building that 
foundational level of trust, the personal relationship, um, you know, with people, and it can be different in different contexts, but, you know, building intimacy, building trust is, you know, a good starting point for, for anything. Um, and then, you know, also finding common ground between the teams, whether that's, you know, shared objectives or, you know, aligning different teams that you're going to be working with on, on a shared vision. And it would also be very important as, you know, the work progresses to make sure that, you know, you're communicating on a regular basis and that people understand how their contributions are, are leading to that vision. Awesome. As you, thank you very much. So it means that as usual, communication is number one thing, which every product person or even people in general need to learn, practice, and I think it will never be, in, even though you can practice that thing, very often you will never, you, there is a plenty of area how you can to improve, improve across that domain. So yeah, thank you very much for your time. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. Hopefully, if you have any other questions, you can continue to comment them. And if you have anything, you can reach us directly. I'm pretty sure you have our LinkedIn profiles, so do not hesitate. And again, thank you very much, Margarita, Aiton, and Ed, to have you here sharing your experience. And hopefully, we'll see us next time in other sessions of the product uh, panel discussions. Thank you. Have a great week, evening, weekend. Bye. Thank you. Thank so you, much. everyone.